Urato, Muse of Lyrics, Euterpe, Muse of Music, Thalia, Muse of Comedy, Malpomene, Muse of Tragedy, Terpsichore, Muse of Dance. The nine muses were daughters of Zeus and the Titaness Nemozine. Their mother's memory was as long as her beautiful hair, for she was the goddess of memory and knew all that had happened since the beginning of time. She gathered her nine daughters around her and told them wondrous tales. She told them about the creation of Earth and the fall of the Titans, about the glorious Olympians and their rise to power, about Prometheus who stole the heavenly fire, about the sun and the stars, and most of all about the greatness and wisdom of their father, Zeus. The nine muses listened to her with wide, sparkling eyes and turned her stories into poems and songs so they would never be forgotten. Apollo, the god of music, trained them and taught them to sing. Harmoniously together, he led the choir of muses through the halls of Olympus and over the slopes of Mount Parnassus, and their music rang so pure and fine that even the songbirds fell silent to listen. Each of the muses had her own special art. Calliope, the muse of heroic poetry, was the first among them. She had a mortal son named Orpheus, and he sang almost as beautifully as the muses themselves. When he was grown, he left his mother and his eight loving aunts and went to live in his father's kingdom of Thrace to bring the joy of music to earth. His voice rang so pure and true that the fiercest warriors put down their swords and savage beasts lay spellbound at his feet. Trees pulled up their roots and moved closer to listen, and even hard rocks rolled up to him. Urania, muse of astronomy. Clio, muse of history. Polyhymnia, muse of hymns. Orpheus, Calliope, muse of epics. Orpheus's music was joyful and gay, for he was in love with Eurydice, a sweet young maiden, and she loved him in return. On the day of their wedding, his song swelled out, filled with happiness as his bride danced on light feet through the meadow. Suddenly, she trod on a snake and sank to the ground, dead of its poisonous bite. Hermes gently closed her eyes and led her away to the underworld. No more songs came from Orpheus's throat. No more tunes rang out from his lyre. All joy had gone out of his life. He had to have his Eurydice back. Weeping and grieving, Orpheus wandered about searching for an entrance to Hades, and when at the end of the world he found it, he did what no living man had ever done before. He went down to the realm of the dead to beg for the return of his beloved. His music had power to move hard rocks. It might also move the cold heart of Hades. Hope gave him back his songs and playing and singing. He walked down the dark, steep path. His silvery voice floated down through the dark like a gentle summer breeze, and its magic moved the iron gates of Hades. They sprang open and let him in, and Cerberus, the three-headed watchdog, lay down at his feet and let him pass. The whole dark underworld stilled and listened to Orpheus's music as he entered the realm of the dead, singing about his great love, begging to have Eurydice back. The fluttering souls hushed. Those condemned to eternal pains stopped groaning, and their torturers, the avenging furies, the Uranes, dropped their whips and wept tears of blood. Hades, the pitiless king of the dead, sat on his black marble throne with Queen Persephone at his side. Even he was so moved by the music that tears rolled down his sallow cheeks and cold Persephone sobbed. Her heart was so touched that she turned to her husband and begged him to let Eurydice go back to the sunny world above. Hades gave his consent, but he made one condition. Orpheus must not look at his bride before they reached the realm of the living. She would walk behind him, but if he turned and looked at her, she must return to the underworld. Overcome with joy, Arpheus started up the dark path and as his music faded into the distance, gloom again descended over the underworld. The way was long, and Orpheus walked on and on. Doubt began to creep into his mind. Had Hades deceived him? Were the sounds he heard behind him really Eurydice's footsteps? He had almost reached the upper world, and could already see a dim light ahead. When he could bear his doubts no longer, he had to turn and see if she really was there. He saw her sweet face, but only for an instant, for again Hermes appeared at her side. He turned her about and led her back to the dark gloom below. Faintly, Orpheus heard her whisper farewell. He had lost her forever through his lack of faith. Orpheus never again found joy on earth. He wandered into the wilderness to grieve in solitude. He sang, but now his songs were so mournful that tears trickled down the cheeks of wild beasts and the willows wept. A band of wild nymphs stormed through the woods, shouting to Orpheus to join them. They yelled and carried on so loudly that they could not hear his silvery voice and were not touched by its magic. 
They wanted him to dance with them, but he had no heart for their revelry, and in a fury they threw themselves over him. They tore him to pieces and tossed his body into a river. The river stopped its gurgling to listen for the haunting voice of Orpheus still issued forth from his dead lips as he floated down to the open sea. The muses grieved over him. They searched the sea till they found his body on the shores of the island of Lesbos. There they gave him a proper funeral, and at least he could rejoin his beloved Eurydice as a flitting ghost in the underworld. The muses sang not only of the gods and of the spirits sprung from Mother Earth, but also of great kings and heroes descended all from mighty Zeus. The tales of heroes and brave men still ring in our ears as we listen to the muses sing. Moral Descendants of Zeus, Europa and Cadmus Joyously the muses sang about lovely Europa, chosen by Zeus to be the first queen of Crete. Her father, King Agner of Tyre, was a descendant of Io, the girl who had fled to Egypt in the shape of a white cow. Zeus had been looking far and wide for a maiden worthy of being queen of Crete, the island where he had been raised. One day his eyes fell on Europa, and her beauty quite captured his heart. Changing himself into a snow-white bull, he trotted about all the meadow by the sea where Europa was playing with her maidens. At first, she was afraid of the strange bull who suddenly stood beside her, but as he looked at her with his big, soft eyes, she lost her fear. She tied a wreath of flowers around his broad neck and gently patted his glistening sides. The bull knelt down at her feet, and trustingly she climbed up on his back and asked him to take her for a ride. He walked up and down the beach with her, and Europa laughed and clapped her hands and called to her maidens to come and see the marvelous bull she had found. But suddenly the bull turned and rushed away over the sea with her. Her maidens cried out in terror, and the king came running out of his palace, just in time to see the bull and his daughter disappear beyond the horizon. Trembling, Europa clung to the horns of the bull. But to her surprise, not a drop of water touched her toes, for nereids swimming all about smoothed the waves with their hands and made the sea a polished road for the bull to run on. Then the bull turned his head and spoke. He was not a bull, he said, but Zeus himself, and he had come to earth to make her his bride and the queen of Crete. When Zeus arrived in Crete with Europa, he put a royal crown of jewels on her head as a token of his love, and she lived in Crete in glory and delight to the end of her days. She had three sons. Minos and Sarpedon, who became great kings, and Radamanthus, who was so wise that after his death he was made a judge in the underworld. When Zeus returned to Olympus, he ordered his son Hephaestus, the smith, to make a bronze robot that would watch over Crete and Europa. Three times a day, Talus, the robot, walked with clanking steps around the shores of the island, and whenever an enemy ship approached, he hurled rocks at it and sank it. The king of Tyre had sent his three sons to search for their kidnapped sister. Two of the brothers soon gave up, but Cadmus, the third brother, sailed on to Greece with his men. There he went to the oracle at Delphi and asked where Europa could be found. His sister was well and happy, he was told, and he must give up the search for her. Instead, he should stay in Greece and found a new kingdom. A snow-white cow would lead him to a good site for a walled city. Cadmus left Delphi, and indeed, before long, he met a white cow. He followed her uphill and downhill, over mountains and through valleys, and at last the cow lay down on top of a knoll in the middle of a wide plain. Cadmus saw with pleasure that it was a perfect site for a walled city. He sent one of his men for water from a nearby bubbling spring. The man did not return. Cadmus sent another man to look for him. He did not return either, and one after another, Cadmus sent off all his men, but none of them came back. At last, he went himself to see what had happened and found a dragon guarding the spring. The monster had devoured all his men, and now it was so sluggish and sleepy that Cadmus easily slayed it. But that did not bring his men back to life, and Cadmus could not build a walled city all alone. He sacrificed the white cow to the gods and begged them for help. Athena answered his plea. Plow a field, she told him. Pull out the dragon's teeth and sew them in the furrows. This advice sounded strange, but Cadmus did as he was told. As soon as the dragon's teeth were sewn, up shot a host of fierce warriors. They rushed at Cadmus, waving their swords, and the terror-struck hero gave himself up for loss. Again, Athena called to him, throw a rock among them. He did, and at once the warriors flew at one another, each accusing his neighbor of having thrown the rock. They fought furiously till only five were left, and they were badly wounded. Cadmus nursed them back to health, and they became his faithful men and helped him to build Thebes, the great walled city with seven gates. Cadmus became a great king, and the gods favored him. 
Zeus gave him Harmonia, a daughter of Aphrodite, for his queen. The gods gave the bride a magic necklace to keep her beautiful and young, and Thebes, ruled by Cadmus and his descendants, became one of the greatest Greek cities. Tantalus and Pelops The muses sang about Tantalus, condemned to suffer forever in the underworld. He stood in water up to his neck, but could never quench his thirst, for whenever he bent to drink, the water receded. Above his head hung branches loaded with fruits, but whenever he tried to pick one, the branch bent out of his reach. Tantalus was a son of Zeus, and he had been so favored by the gods that he had been invited to feast with them on high Olympus. In return, he had asked the gods to come to dine in his palace in Asia Minor. He was a king of vast riches, but nothing he owned seemed good enough to set before his exalted guests. His son, Pelops, was his greatest treasure, and, wanting to give the gods his best, Tantalus decided to sacrifice him. He made a stew of him and set the dish before the gods, but the Olympian gods detested human sacrifice. Outraged, they threw Tantalus to the punishing grounds in the underworld and brought Pelops back to life. But one of his shoulder bones was missing, and the gods replaced it with a piece of ivory. They all gave him rich gifts. Poseidon gave him a team of fast horses and told him to set off and win himself a new kingdom. In Greece, there was a beautiful princess whose name was Hippodamia. She was the daughter of Enomus, the king of Elis, and whoever married her would inherit his kingdom, but her father loved her so dearly that he could not bear to part with her. He had a team of horses given to him by Ares, the god of war, whose son he was, and whenever a suitor came to ask for his daughter's hand, Enomas challenged him to a chariot race. If the suitor won, he would win the princess. If he lost, he would lose his head. No horses on earth could outrun the horses of Ares, and the heads of twelve suitors already hung at the gates of the palace. When Pelops arrived in Elis to woo the princess, Enomos did not know that Pelops also had a team of magic horses, and the king looked forward to nailing the thirteenth head on the gates. But Hippodamia fell in love with the young prince and wanted to save his life. She asked her father's stable boy to fix the king's chariot so that Pelops would win. The stable boy, eager to please her, did more than he was asked to do. He took out the wooden pins that held the wheels to the axle and replaced them with pins of wax. Never had there been such a race. The fiery horses ran neck to neck and the king, to his surprise, could not pull ahead no matter how hard he swung the whip. Then suddenly the wax pins gave way, the wheels of the chariot flew off and the king was thrown to his death. Pelops married Hippodamia and became the king of Elis. He flung the faithless stable boy into the sea and gave the old king a magnificent funeral feast inviting heroes from all over Greece to take part in athletic games in his honor and offered fabulous prizes to the winners for Pelops had brought with him the great riches of his father, Tantalus. The games were held on the plain of Olympia in Elis and were to be repeated every four years. They were called the Olympic Games. Danaus, Perseus, and the Gorgon Loud was the song of the muses about Danaus, first of a line of great kings and heroes. King Danaus of Libya had fifty daughters. His brother, King Aegyptus, had fifty sons. The fifty sons wanted to marry the fifty daughters, but they were rough and rowdy, and King Danaus did not want them for son-in-laws. He feared that they might carry off his daughters by force, so secretly he built a ship with fifty oars and fled with his daughters. The fifty princesses pulled at the oars and rowed the ship across the wide sea. They reached Argos in Greece, and when the people there saw the king standing in the prow of a gorgeous ship rowed by princesses, they were awed. They were certain that Danaus had been sent by the gods and made him their king. Danaus was a good ruler, and peace and happiness reigned in Argos until one day another splendid ship arrived. And who should be at the oars but King Aegyptus's fifty sons, who had come to claim their brides? Danaus did not dare to oppose them and had a lavish wedding feast prepared. But secretly he gave each of his fifty daughters a dagger and ordered them all to kill their husbands as soon as they were alone. Forty-nine of the brides obeyed him. But Hypermnestra, the eldest, fell in love with Lensis, her prince, and fled with him. In vain did Danaus try to find new husbands for his widowed daughters. Nobody dared to marry them. The forty-nine Danaides had to live a life without joy, and when they died and came to the underworld, they were sentenced to carry water forever in sieves, trying in vain to fill a bath and wash off their sins. When King Danaus grew old, there was no heir to his throne, and he had to send for Hypernestrum and Lysias, who were living in great happiness. They became king and queen of Argos, and their son became king after them. When he died, his son, Acrisius, inherited the throne. 
Acrisius, however, had no son. He had only a beautiful golden-haired daughter whose name was Danae, but her beauty brought no joy to her father. He wanted a son and heir to his kingdom. When an oracle told him that he would die by the hand of his daughter's son, he put Danae in a sealed chamber that had neither windows nor doors, only an opening in the roof. There no suitor could see her beauty, and she would remain unwed and childless. But Acrisius forgot to reckon with Zeus. The thunder god spied the lonesome maiden through the opening in the roof, and in the shape of a golden shower he descended to her. No longer was Danae lonesome, for now she was the happy bride of Zeus. But when her father heard the cries of an infant from her chamber, he broke through the walls in a rage, intending to kill his grandson. When he learned that Zeus was the child's father, he did not dare to lay his hands on him. Instead, he put Danae and her son, Perseus, in a chest and threw it into the sea. If they drowned, Poseidon would be to blame. Zeus gently steered the chest to the shore of an island, and a fisherman who was casting his nets hauled it in. Great was his surprise when he saw what the chest contained. When Danae had told him her story, he took her and little Perseus to his hut and cared for them as if they were his own, for he was a kind old man and childless. In his humble hut, Perseus grew into a fine and valiant youth, proud of being the son of Zeus and the beautiful Danae. But Danae's beauty attracted the eye of the ruthless king of the island. He wanted her for his queen. In vain did Danae turn him away. She was the bride of Zeus and swore that she could marry no other. The king pursued her and would have carried her off by force if Perseus had not protected her. The scheming king decided to get rid of Perseus, and he let it be known that he was going to marry a princess from a neighboring island. As was the custom, all the men in the kingdom brought him gifts. Only Perseus was so poor that he had nothing to give, so he offered his services to the king instead. This was just what the king had expected. Slay the monster Medusa and bring me her head, he said. No man who had ever set out to kill Medusa had come back, and the king was sure that now he was forever rid of Perseus. Medusa was one of three horrible Gorgon sisters, so gruesome that all living creatures turned to stone at the sight of them. They lived on an island far out at sea, but nobody knew just where. Perseus bid his mother goodbye and set out to search for Medusa. He went over land and over sea asking his way, but nobody could tell him where the Gorgons lived. As he stood at a crossroad, wondering which way to go, Athena and Hermes suddenly appeared. Zeus had sent them to help him. They could tell him the way to the island of the Gorgons, but he needed more help than that. Athena lent him her shield, polished as brightly as a mirror. Hermes lent him his sword, which was so sharp that it could cut through the hardest metal, and he also needed three magic things owned by the nymphs of the north, they told him, but even the gods did not know where these nymphs lived. That was a secret closely guarded by the three Grey Sisters, and they would never willingly reveal it, for they were the Gorgons' sisters. But Hermes offered to take Perseus to them and find a way to get the secret out of them. He took Perseus under his arm, swung himself into the air, and flew off, swifter than the wind. They flew far, far to the west, and at last they came to a land where the sun never shone and everything was as gray as dusk. There sat the three gray sisters. Their hair was gray, their faces were gray, and they had only one gray eye between them, which they took turns looking through. As one of the sisters was handing the eye to another, Perseus sprang forward and snatched it. Now I have your eye, cried Perseus. You will never get it back unless you tell me the way to the nymphs of the north. The three gray sisters wailed and begged for their eye, but Perseus would not give it back, and so they had to tell him the way. Again Hermes took him under his arm and flew with him far, far to the north, beyond the north wind, where the sun never set. The nymphs of the north received him kindly, and when they heard why Perseus had come, they gladly lent him the three things he needed, a pair of winged sandals to carry him through the air, a cap to make him invisible, and a magic bag to hold whatever was put into it. Now he was ready to slay the Medusa, said Hermes. He showed him the way and wished him good luck. Wearing the winged sandals, Perseus flew far to the west. When he came to the island of the Gorgons, he did not look down. He looked instead into Athena's polished shield and shuddered at the sight he saw mirrored there. The three Gorgon sisters were lying on the shore, fast asleep. Long yellow fangs hung from their grinning mouths, on their heads grew writhing snakes instead of hair, and their necks were covered with scales of bronze. Around them stood the strangest stones. It was easy to see that they had once been men. Looking into the mirroring shield, Perseus swooped down, and with one deft stroke he cut off the Medusa's head. Out from the monster's severed neck sprang a beautiful winged horse, the Pegasus. He neighed, and the other two Gorgons awoke. Quickly Perseus threw Medusa's head into the magic bag and swung himself into the air. 
Wailing, the two Gorgon sisters took to the air on heavy wings in groping pursuit. They could not find him, for he had put on the magic cap of invisibility. On his way home, as he flew over the coast of Ethiopia, Perseus saw, far below, a beautiful maiden chained to a rock by the sea. She was so pale that at first he thought she was a marble statue, but then he saw tears trickling from her eyes. He swooped down and tore at her chains, trying to break them. Flee, she said, or you too will be devoured by the sea monster. But Perseus refused to leave, and she told her sad story. Her name was Andromeda, and she was the daughter of King Cepheus and Queen Cassiopeia. Her mother was very vain and had boasted unwisely that she was even lovelier than the Nereids. Poseidon could not tolerate having a mortal compare herself to the goddesses of the sea, and as punishment he sent a sea monster to ravage the kingdom of Ethiopia. To appease the angry god and save his kingdom, her father had to sacrifice her, his only daughter, to the monster. And there she stood, chained to the cliff, waiting to be devoured. She had begged the prince to whom she was engaged to save her, but he had fled in fear. I shall save you, and you shall be mine, said Perseus. As he spoke, a horrible sea monster came from the sea, its huge mouth opened wide to swallow Andromeda. But Perseus sprang into the air, dived at the monster, and drove his sword deep into its throat. The monster bellowed, lashed its tail wildly, and rolled over on its back. It sank, and the sea was tinted red by its blood. Ever since, that stretch of water has been called the Red Sea. No sooner was the monster dead than Andromeda's cowardly suitor returned with many warriors to claim her for his bride. Now he was bold and menacing, and King Cepheus did not dare to oppose him. Andromeda, shield your eyes, cried Perseus, and with that he lifted the head of the Medusa out of the bag. The suitor and his men stared in horror and whips. They were changed into stones. Unfortunately, the king and the queen had also looked at the gorgon's head, and they too turned into stone. But since a son of Zeus was going to marry their daughter, the gods took pity on them and hung Cepheus and Cassiopeia in the sky as constellations. Perseus lifted Andromeda into his arms and flew homewards. But when he arrived at the fisherman's hut, he learned that Danae and the fisherman had gone into hiding. As soon as the king of the island had gotten rid of Perseus, he had tried to carry Danae off. To save her, the kind old fisherman had fled with her. When Perseus heard that, he made straight for the king's palace. Here is the head you wanted, he shouted, and pulled Medusa's head out of the bag. Startled, the king and his men looked up, and there they sat, turned into statues of stone, some of them with their mouths still open in astonishment. The people of the island rejoiced at being rid of the tyrant, and as soon as the fishermen and Danae came out of hiding, they made the fishermen their new king. He gave Perseus and Andromeda the grandest of wedding feasts, and everybody was happy. Perseus did not keep the gorgon's head. It was much too dangerous for a mortal to own. He gave it to Athena when he returned her shield and the other magic objects he had borrowed. Perseus thought that his grandfather, Acrisius, would be happy to see him now that he was a hero, and he set sail for Argos with Danae and Andromeda. But when the old king learned that his grandson was approaching, he fled, for he still remembered the oracle's warning, and so Perseus became king of Argos. Perseus ruled wisely and well, his mother and his wife always at his side. Since he was a great athlete, he also took part in games all over Greece. One day, a sudden gust of wind changed the course of a discus he had thrown, and it killed an old man who was watching the games. Who should that old man be but Acrisius, his grandfather? Thus the words of the oracle came true. After that, Perseus no longer wanted to live in his grandfather's city, Argos, so he founded instead the splendid fortified city of Mycenae, not far away, and many great kings and heroes were descended from him and Andromeda. When at last Perseus and Andromeda died, Zeus put them, too, in the sky as constellations. Clever and Vainglorious Kings When Perseus gave Athena the Gorgons' head, she fashioned it on her breastplate, and it made her still more powerful. She also fetched two of Medusa's bones, and from them she made herself a double flute. She could not understand why Hera and Aphrodite burst out laughing every time she played on it, for she was very pleased with the music she made. But one day she saw her own image in her polished shield. With puckered lips and puffed cheeks, she did not look at all like her stately self. In disgust, she threw the flute down to earth and put a curse on it. Marcius, a satyr who was capering about in the Phrygian woods, found the flute and began to play on it. When he discovered he could play two melodies at the same time, he was wild with joy. He hopped through the woods, playing on his double flute, boasting that now he could make better music than Apollo himself. Apollo frowned when he had heard that a satyr dared compare himself to him, the god of music, and he stormed down from Olympus to the Phrygian woods. 
he found Marcius, who was so delighted with his own music that he even challenged Apollo to a contest. You shall have your contest, said Apollo, but if I win, you shall lose your hide. The nine muses, of course, were to be the judges, and Marcius insisted that King Midas of Phrygia also be a judge. King Midas was a kind but rather stupid man who had always been a friend to the Phrygian satyrs. One morning, his servants had found an old satyr sleeping in the king's favorite flower bed. Midas had spared the satyr from punishment and let him go. This old satyr was a follower of Dionysus, and the god had rewarded Midas for his kindness by granting him a wish. Short-sightedly, King Midas wished that everything he touched would turn to gold. His golden touch made him the richest man on earth, but he almost starved to death for even his food and drink turned to gold. And when his little daughter ran to him to hug him, she too turned into gold. Midas had to beg Dionysus to undo his wish and make everything as it had been before. Now again, King Midas showed poor judgment. The nine muses all agreed that Apollo was by far the better musician, but Midas voted for the Phrygian satyr. Apollo disdainfully turned his lyre upside down and played just as well as before. He ordered Marcius to turn his flute and do the same. Not a sound came from Marcius's flute, however hard he blew, and even Midas had to admit that the satyr's flute was inferior to Apollo's lyre. So Marcius lost the contest, and Apollo pulled off his skin and made a drum of it. Then he turned to King Midas and said, Ears as stupid as yours belong to an ass. Ass's ears you shall have from now on. Ever after, King Midas went about with a tall, peaked cap on his head to hide his long ears. His subjects thought he had started a new fashion, and it wasn't long before all the Phrygians wore tall, peaked caps. The king's barber was the only one who knew what Midas was hiding. He had been forbidden to breathe a word about it, and he almost burst from having to keep such an important secret. When he could bear it no longer, he ran out to a lonesome field, dug a hole in the ground, and whispered into it, King Midas has ass's ears. He quickly covered up the hole and thought the secret was safe, but the nearby reeds had heard, and as they swayed in the wind, they whispered, Midas has ass's ears, Midas has ass's ears, and soon the secret spread all over the world. King Midas was so ashamed that he left his throne and hid deep in the woods where no one could see him. Sisyphus of Corinth was the cleverest king who ever lived. He was so cunning that he fooled even the gods. One day Sisyphus saw the river god Asaphus, who was looking for his daughter Angina. Sisyphus, who noticed everything that was happening in his kingdom, went after him and said, I'll tell you what has become of your daughter if you'll give my city a spring. For the only thing his great city lacked was a good supply of fresh water. Asaphus hated to part with any of his water. He twisted and squirmed, but at last he struck the ground, and a crystal clear spring bubbled forth. It is Zeus himself who has carried off your daughter, said Sisyphus. I saw him hurry by with her, and he pointed out to Asopus the way Zeus had taken. The river god rushed off in a fury and soon caught up with the elopers. Zeus, taken by surprise, had no thunderbolt at hand, so, to save himself and the nymph from the river god's rage, he changed himself into a rock and her into the island Agina. Sisyphus had his spring of water, but Asopus lost his daughter, and Zeus was furious with Sisyphus for meddling in his affairs. He asked Hades to take him to the underworld and punish him severely. Hades was glad to do his brother Zeus a favor, and he went himself to fetch Sisyphus. When the sly king saw the lord of the dead in person, he pretended to be very honored. But why, he asked, had not Hermes, whose office it was to guide dead souls to the underworld, come for him? While Hades searched for a suitable answer, Sisyphus deftly wound a chain around him, and there stood the Lord of the Dead, chained to a post like a dog. As long as Sisyphus kept Hades tied up, nobody could die. The fates got the threads of life tangled, and the whole world was in confusion. Finally, the gods threatened to make life so miserable for Sisyphus that he would wish he were dead, and Sisyphus then had to let Hades go. Again, people could die, and life could go on normally. The very first soul to be claimed was, of course, that of Sisyphus himself. This time, Aramis came for him. The wily king, who had expected this, had told his loving wife not to give him a funeral feast and not to put a coin under his tongue. So he arrived in the realm of the dead as a poor beggar. Hades was shocked. After all, Sisyphus was a king and entitled to a funeral feast and a golden coin under his tongue to pay for his passage across the Styx. His wife had to be punished, or she might set a bad example for others. He sent Sisyphus back to earth and told him to teach his wife respect. 
Fooled him again, said Sisyphus when he rejoined his devoted wife. They lived happily for many long years, till at last he died of old age and went to Hades for good. There he was given a task that kept him too busy to think up new tricks. He had to push a boulder up a steep hill, but every time he had almost reached the top, the boulder slipped from his hands and rolled all the way to the bottom again. Bellerophon, a grandson of Sisyphus, was a great tamer of horses. He would have given all he owned for a ride on the winged horse Pegasus, who had sprung out of Medusa's neck. Pegasus had flown to Greece, where the nine muses had found him and tended him. They were the only ones who could come close enough to touch him, for Pegasus was wild and swift. One night, Bellerophon fell asleep in Athena's temple. He dreamed that the goddess gave him a golden bridle that would make the flying horse tame, and when he awoke, he really held a golden bridle in his hand. Not long thereafter, Pegasus flew over Corinth, saw the clear spring that Sisyphus had won from the river god, and stopped to drink. Carefully, Bellerophon tiptoed up to the winged horse and flung the bridle over his head. The horse neighed, looked at Bellerophon, and suddenly he was so tame that Bellerophon could mount him. Never had there been such a horse and such a horseman. They galloped through the air, over land and over sea, faster than the wind. On the back of his flying horse, Bellerophon set off to fight the Chimera, a fire-breathing beast that was ravaging the kingdom of Alicia in Asia Minor. The Chimera was more fearful than a nightmare. She was lying in front, serpent in back and goat in between. She spat fire from all her three heads and her hide was so tough that no weapon could pierce it. Swooping down as close as he dared without singeing the coat of his flying horse, Bellerophon went at the monster with a lump of lead stuck to the end of his spear. The chimera hissed like a serpent, bleated like a goat, and as she opened wide her lion's jaws to roar, he thrust the lump of lead down her throat. Her flaming breath melted the lead and it trickled into her stomach and killed her. The people of Lycia, who had been hiding in fear behind bolted doors, now dared to come out, and the king of the country was so thankful that he gave Bellerophon the hand of his daughter. When the old king died, Bellerophon inherited the kingdom. He became a great king, loved by his people, feared by his neighbors and all the monsters lurking nearby. But his fame went to his head, and he grew so vain that he thought he was as great as the gods. He even held himself equal to Zeus. He soared ever higher on his flying horse, and at last he tried to enter Olympus itself. There, pride took a spill. Pegasus threw him, and Bellerophon fell to earth, landing in thistle thorns in a distant country. Torn and lame, he wandered about as an unknown beggar until he died. Pegasus entered Olympus alone, and Zeus made the handsome winged horse the carrier of his thunderbolts. Melampus, a cousin of Bellerophon, won glory and fame and one-third of a kingdom, all because he was kind to animals. Once when he was a child, he found a dead mother snake on the road. He did not kick it into a ditch, but gave it a proper funeral, picking up the little motherless snakes and reared them tenderly. In gratitude, they licked his ears so clean that he could understand the language of all animals, crawling and flying. From their talk, he learned the secrets of the earth and grew wise beyond measure. Once he was thrown into prison for trying to steal some cows from a neighboring king, and one night as he lay on his cot, he heard a family of termites talking inside the roof beam. Brother, said one termite to another, if we go on chewing all night, the roof will collapse before morning. Melampus jumped up and hammered at the door. He demanded to be moved at once, for the roof would soon fall in. The jailer laughed, but Melampus made such a fuss that he was finally moved. Just then the roof did cave in. Everybody marveled, and the king called for him and told him that, if he could find a cure for his sick son, he could have the cows he had tried to steal. The young prince had been sick since he was a child, and no one knew what ailed him. Melampa slaughtered an ox and spread the meat on the ground. Right away, two vultures swooped down and began to gorge themselves. When they had eaten their fill, one of the vultures said to the other, I haven't been so full since that time when the king sacrificed a ram to the gods. I remember how terrified the little prince was when he saw his father with a bloody knife in his hand. He screamed so loudly that his father threw away his knife and ran to comfort him. The knife stuck in the tree over yonder and wounded the tree nymph. She cast a smell on the boy and he has been sick ever since. Now the bark has closed over the knife, but if the king knew what I know, he would dig out the rusty blade, make a brew from the rust, and give it to the prince to drink. Melampus at once dug out the blade and made a rusty brew. The sickly prince drank it, and right away he was so fit that he bounded over a field of barley without bending a stalk. Melampus won great fame as a healer, and from all corners of Greece, kings sent for him to cure their sick. The king of Tyrans had three lovely daughters who suddenly went quite out of their minds and thought they were cows. The king sent for Melampus, who said that he would cure them if the king would give him a third of his kingdom. 
That was far too much, thought the king, and Melampus went away. The princesses grew worse and ran all over the kingdom, mooing like cows. The king again sent for Melampus. This time Melampus came with his brother, and now he wanted a third of the kingdom for his brother, too. The king had to agree, for it was very embarrassing to him that his daughters ran around shouting, We are cows! We are cows! Melampus hired some fast runners and sent them after the crazy girls. They had to run halfway across Greece before they could catch them and bring them back. Melampus forced them to drink a drought of magic herbs, and that cured all of them except one poor girl who died of exhaustion. The king, who had to part with two-thirds of his kingdom, thought that he might as well give Melampus and his brother each a princess in the bargain, and they all lived happily thereafter.